Well, welcome everyone to FuseNet's briefing on the food security outlook for Yemen for the period of June 2023 to January 2024. My name is Diana Bartone, Senior Food Security Analyst based in FuseNet's Washington, D.C. office, and it's great to be here with you all sharing our, anal our latest analysis for Yemen. So today I'll start as usual by providing an overview to FuseNet's uh, approach to early warning analysis, as well as a quick look at the global integrated phase classification or IPC scale that we use to classify acute food insecurity outcomes. We'll then move into our content for Yemen for the majority of the presentation, starting with key messages, then moving to current situation updates, followed by our key assumptions that define the most likely scenario for the projection period, and then finally ending with FUSENET's projected acute food insecurity outcomes for the projection period through January 2024. So as uh, many of you likely already know, FuseNet uses a scenario development approach to project acute food insecurity outcomes. And our process has eight key steps that you can see here. First, we define the parameters of the analysis, including um, defining the specific population group and time period to be analyzed. We then in step two, analyze current food security conditions and outcomes. And we do this by gathering data and information that informs an understanding of households' current access to food and income and any gaps that they may be facing in their ability to meet their minimum basic needs. And a defining feature of FuseNet's approach is that we do this and all subsequent steps within a livelihoods framework that starts by understanding how households we are analyzing typically access food and income. So our baseline livelihoods information tells us what sources of food and income we need to be investigating in the first place. And once we have a clear picture of the current situation, we then turn to our projection analysis. And the first step in this, step three in our overall approach, is to develop evidence-based assumptions about how key drivers of acute food insecurity, such as conflict or food prices, are most likely to behave throughout our projection period. In steps four and five, we then translate these assumptions into likely impacts on households' access to food and income in our forward-looking projection period. We then synthesize these expectations into a total picture of whether households' access to food and income is likely to meet their needs and classify most likely acute food insecurity outcomes according to the size of any gaps that they may be expected to face. And that's in step six. And then in step seven, from there, we assign one classification to the overall area, which we use in our mapping. Finally, as there's always some element of uncertainty in our assumptions, we always identify any key events to be on the lookout for that might change the most likely scenario, such as a change in crop production expectations due to unpredictable flooding, for one example. And for classifying acute food and security outcomes, FuseNet uses the globally recognized IPC scale. And here you can see the household level definitions of the scale's five phases, which increase in severity from phase one, called none at the household level, where households are able to meet their essential food and non-food needs, to phase five, catastrophe at the household level, where households are facing wide food consumption gaps that are associated with starvation and death. But it is not just in phase five when households require urgent intervention. Phase three and higher are severe phases where households are facing food consumption gaps associated with acute malnutrition and hunger related mortality or are only mitigating these gaps through unsustainable cop coping options. So it is beginning in phase three when urgent humanitarian assistance is required to prevent food consumption gaps and or damage to livelihoods. And here you can see the criteria for classifying an overall area in a given phase. And in summary, it is when 20% or more of households in an area meet the criteria for a given phase or for a more severe phase when we classify and map the area in that phase. As an example, for an area to be classified in phase three, the worst off 20% of households would be facing phase three or worse outcomes. So a key point for interpreting our mapping is therefore that within any given area, there can be a sizable share of households facing worse outcomes than the overall area level classification, but this group would be less than 20% of the area's population at maximum. 
And at the area level, you'll note that the phase definitions are similar to those at the household level, um, but also include criteria for incorporating population level data on acute malnutrition and mortality in classifying an overall area. So now turning to our content for Yemen, starting with key messages for the briefing. And there's a lot of text on this slide, so this can be also used as um, a reference following the briefing, so forgive me for that. Um, but first, the first conflict between the Sanaa-based authorities, or SBA, as you will hear me say throughout the briefing, and the internationally recognized government, or IRG, has not re-escalated since the official UN-mediated truce expired in October of 2022. Um, the reduction in conflict has led to some slight improvements in the business and trade environment, though recovery of livelihoods and income earning opportunities will be gradual given the substantial time needed for full economic recovery, especially after so many years of war. Second, despite reductions in active fighting, both sides continue to engage in economic warfare tactics. Notably, the SBA continues to block oil exports from IRG-controlled seaports, denying the IRG their key source of government revenue. Meanwhile, both sides are competing for imports through seaports under their control, with the SBA also blocking the movement of goods from IRG to SBA-controlled areas via land borders, causing the IRG to lose further revenue from associated taxes. Now, third, consequently, in IRG-controlled areas, shortages of government revenue and foreign exchange have worsened economic conditions and driven a further increase in food prices, though prices have risen at a slower pace than last year. Meanwhile, in SBA-controlled areas, food prices have declined slightly compared to last year due to declining global food prices, declining domestic fuel prices, and associated price ceilings strictly enforced by the SBA. At the same time, labor wage rates have generally risen across the country, um, well, particularly in IRG controlled areas, and purchasing power has improved or remained stable compared to this time last year in most, but not all govern governorates as a consequence of trends in food prices and wage rates. Due to funding shortfalls, the provision of humanitarian food assistance has been reduced further in 2023. And now effective rations are expected to be equivalent to around one third of households total minimum energy needs. Um, though households are in actuality likely meeting a lower share of their food needs from assistance due to sharing of rations. Overall, this is a notable decline compared to the effective 80% rations that households were receiving through the end of 2021, however. And finally, in October, the start of the main harvest season across most of the country will provide some increased access to food and income for rural households. However, millions of rural and urban households will be unable to meet their minimum food needs due to highly limited livelihood and income, opportun income earning opportunities and in IRG controlled areas, expectations for rising food prices. Amid assistance cuts, crisis IPC phase three and crisis exclamation mark, IPC phase three exclamation mark, um, with the exclamation mark denoting that assistance is preventing a worse phase. Um, these outcomes are expected to remain widespread throughout January, um, through, I'm sorry, through January 2024, with an estimated 50 to 55% of the population in need of food assistance. Given expectations for income earning and prices, needs are generally expected to rise in IRG controlled areas, and this is expected to offset a, a general anticipated decline in needs in SBA controlled areas uh, due to expectations for some slight recovery in income earning opportunities. Now, before we turn into our current situation updates, um, this is a look at FuseNet seasonal calendar for Yemen just to orient ourselves um, to the seasonality that's relevant for the current situation period. And this seasonal calendar, I would note, shows some broad trends across the country, but there is notable regional variability. So as of our June current situation period for this analysis, the first rainy season had just concluded, as had the bulk of spring cereal harvesting across the country. And the peak period of labor demand in lowland areas associated with the main fruit and vegetable cultivation season. 
So now for our current situation updates. Um, first, as everyone is likely aware, conflict has been the main driver of acute food insecurity in Yemen for many years. And this continues to be the case as years of protracted conflict have significantly eroded livelihoods and income earning opportunities. However, as you can see clearly illustrated here, levels of conflict have declined notably alongside the peace talks and unofficial ceasefire that have been underway despite the, the expiration of the official truce in October 2022. And declining levels of conflict have had some positive impacts, including an overall reduction in civilian casualties, lower levels of population displacement, and improved humanitarian access. Notably, there have also been some slight improvements in the business and trade environment due to reduced active conflict and eased importation restrictions. However, this is mainly benefiting households in SBA-controlled areas as IRG-controlled areas continue to face deteriorating macroeconomic conditions overall. Additionally, it should be noted that some key trade routes remain closed and that landmines and IEDs continue to limit movement and access to agricultural land despite reductions in active conflict. Now, though there has been a reduction in active conflict, there has been a concurrent escalation in economic warfare tactics between the SBA and IRG. And a key feature of this has been competition between the SBA and IRG to attract imports through seaports in areas under their control. And in the early months of 2023, both sides prevailed on the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia to ease importation inspection requirements as part of the ongoing peace negotiations. Shortly following this, the SBA began to block imports from IRG controlled areas via land borders in order to pressure traders to reroute imports through SBA controlled seaports. And so we've been paying close attention to this situation, including um, to available importation data, um, which is what you can see in the graph on this slide in order to understand any shifts that may be occurring in supply chains because these shifts um, will not only have implications for um, government revenue associated with the imports themselves, but also potentially for prices of the commodities that are affected due to changing supply and demand. And we've indeed seen evidence so far of some shifts, but only for specific commodities. Um, for example, this slide is showing the three month moving average of the share of basic food commodities imported through ports in SBA controlled areas, um, as opposed to IRG controlled areas through April, 2023, uh, actually through May, but the three month moving average is through April. And what I wanna point out is the trend for cooking oil, which is shown in light blue. And you can indeed see that the share of cooking oil imported through SBA controlled ports has increased since early 20, 2023, um, the same time when importation restrictions were eased. However, we don't yet see strong evidence for shifts in supply chains of other commodities, um, such as notably for staple wheat grain, despite pressure that the SBA authorities are putting on traders of these commodities. Another key development in the economic war occurred previously in late 2022, around the same time that the official truce expired. Um, and this was when the SBA began to block all exports from IRG, sorry, all oil exports from IRG controlled areas um, by essentially threatening to target oil production and export infrastructure with drone strikes should um, this infrastructure be used for exports. And the, ces the cessation of oil exports has effectively cut the IRG off from its most important source of government revenue and foreign exchange. And as a result, pre-existing shortages of government revenue and foreign exchange in IRG controlled areas have notably worsened, driving continued depreciation of the local currency in IRG controlled areas, um, which is a trend that you can see shown on this graph in blue. And shortages of revenue and foreign exchange are also leading to further disruptions to already insufficient provision of public services such as electricity and payments of civil servant salaries in IRG controlled areas um, with the military sector already experiencing additional delays in the payment of their salaries. 
Meanwhile, in SBA controlled areas, the value of the local currency remains generally stable under a fixed exchange rate regime and tight control of the foreign currency market. Now we'll turn to look at food prices, which are, of course, very important to food security in Yemen. In Yemen, most poor households, even in rural areas, depend on markets for a notable share of their food as the contribution of agriculture um, to households' own food supply is relatively limited. And I would note that uh, most of Yemen's staple food supply is also imported, with local production contributing only minimally. So on this slide, we are looking at the cost of the minimum food basket on average across IRG controlled areas um, in blue and on average across SBA controlled areas in orange up through June 2023. And you can see that food prices have generally been increasing in IRG controlled areas um, still in recent months to date due to depreciation of the currency, which is making imports more expensive despite declining global food prices, though the rate of food price increases has slowed over the past year compared to previously. Meanwhile, in SBA-controlled areas, food prices have actually been declining over the course of the past year, and these declining food prices are due to declining global food prices and lower domestic fuel prices, which have reduced transportation costs alongside strict enforcement of price controls by the authorities. So as of June 2023, the average cost of the minimum food basket across IRG controlled areas was 11% higher than the same time last year, while the average cost across SBA controlled areas was 14% lower than the same time last year. Um, However, as you can see from the longer term trends illustrated um, in the time series graph, food prices certainly remain well above average and significantly higher than pre-crisis levels across the country. Now we'll look at how food prices have impacted household purchasing power. And to do this, we'll focus on purchasing power for daily wage laborers, as daily wage labor is a common primary source of income, often even the sole source of income for poor households in Yemen. So on this graph, we have three types of indicators, so I'll explain them um, one by one. And all of these indicators are looking at the value of the indicator in June 2023 compared to the value at the same time last year in June 2022. So first on the left and in the blue bars, we are looking at the cost of the minimum food basket in June 2023, which is what we just um, saw on the previous slide. So again, um, the cost has increased by 11% in IRG controlled areas and declined by 14% in SBA controlled areas on average over the past year. Then the next two pairs of bars are showing trends in wage rates for laborers. In light green, you can see that on average across IRG controlled areas, um, agricultural labor wage rates have increased considerably compared to last year, driven at least in part by general inflation in IRG controlled areas. Meanwhile, in SBA controlled areas, agricultural labor wage rates remain similar to last year on average. Then looking at the pale orange bars, we see a generally similar pattern for casual or unskilled labor wage rates as well. The remaining bars present a proxy measure for purchasing power that we call the terms of trade. And this is simply a measure of the amount of the minimum food basket that a laborer could, a laborer could purchase given prevailing wage rates and food prices um, at the particular point in time we're looking at. And what we can see is that driven largely by rising wage rates in IRG controlled areas and declining food prices in SBA controlled areas, purchasing power for laborers has generally improved over the past year in both IRG and SBA controlled areas. However, I would emphasize that these um, area level averages for IRG and SBA controlled areas do mask a notable variations across governorates, and that's true for the food prices, wage rates, and terms of trade as well, consequently. Um, and declining terms of trade have been observed in, in some governorates.
And now shifting to look at the performance of the first rainy season, the map on the left is showing cumulative rainfall during the full first rainy season from March to May 2023. And um, it's looking at anomalies um, expressed as the difference between the received cumulative rainfall and the average for that time period. And you can see that rainfall was above average across most of the country in Yemen's um, recently concluded first rainy season. And this was generally beneficial to crop production despite some incidents of flooding, um, with crop production in 2023 expected to be slightly better than last year overall. And the map on the right shows a satellite derived measure of vegetation health. And you can see that currently highland areas of Yemen are benefiting from abundant vegetation shown with green colors. And this has been supported by the recent favorable rainy season. Um, and this is also expected to be supporting livestock health due to abundant pasture in the highland areas where you can see the green. I would note though um, that alongside the deterioration of livelihoods that has occurred over the years, given the numerous direct and indirect impacts of the conflict that overall, um, though better than last year, crop, crop and livestock production outcomes are still expected to be significantly below average and pre-conflict levels. And finally, turning to look at trends in humanitarian assistance provision. In Yemen, more than a third of the country's population has been receiving regular distributions of humanitarian food assistance for many years. And this graph illustrates some recent shifts in the scale of assistance provision um, since the end of 2018. And what this graph is actually showing is the number of beneficiaries reached with emergency food assistance per month um, as per available distribution reports. Um, but we can see some shifts based on changes in frequency of assistance distribution over time. So the blue bars correspond to points in time when almost all beneficiaries were reached with assistance distributions once a month. And generally rations were expected to be equivalent to around 80% of households minimum energy requirements. And that's um, the ration size per distribution. However, um, recently in 2022, I wanna highlight shown in the yellow bars, WFP transitioned from monthly distributions of assistance to distributions only around once every six weeks due to funding shortfalls. Additionally, what this chart doesn't show is the volatility in ration sizes that have occurred um, in 2022, whereas previously each assistance distribution provided around 80% of a household's minimum monthly energy requirements. Ration sizes generally declined in 2022 for many beneficiaries, according to available data and information from the Food Security and Agriculture Cluster. And by WFP's fourth distribution cycle of 2022, which was completed in September, most beneficiaries were receiving around 50% of less or less of their total energy requirements per distribution. Um, However, beginning in the fifth distribution cycle that started in late September 2022, WFP had slightly increased ration sizes again, with most beneficiaries expected to be receiving 65% rations um, per distribution. So again, because that could be a little confusing, um, we mean that each distribution provided rations equivalent to 65% of a household's needs for one month. Um, so given the six week frequency, this would be spread um, more thin and would be lower um, effective ration sizes. Most recently in 2023, WFP has further reduced distribution frequency to once every eight months. Um, so with that, the 65% rations per distribution um, now spread out uh, equate to effective rations of around only one third of households total minimum energy needs on average. So households are generally receiving assistance equivalent to a third of their energy needs um, expressed very simply, but they're also expected to be sharing that assistance um, with 
the community um, and non-beneficiaries in their community. So given that, many households are expected to be meeting an even lower share of their food needs from assistance currently in 2023. So this has been quite um, a notable reduction over the period of the past year and a half. And that brings us to our current food security outcomes. So currently in June, many rural households continue to benefit from slightly improved availability of food and income, including from crop production following the recently concluded spring cereal harvest and from income from agricultural labor following the recent fruit and vegetable cultivation season in lowland agricultural areas. Additionally, improvements in purchasing power, as illustrated earlier for laborers over the past year in many but not all areas, are helping households access more food from markets. However, humanitarian assistance cuts have at the same time also increased households' reliance on market purchases compared to previously. And this is the case across the country. And it should be noticed, no, noted that purchasing power uh, overall remains significantly below pre-conflict levels, um, despite the, the recent improvements due to significantly above average prices. Um, and this is also the case amid the continuation of highly limited opportunities for income earning. So it's still difficult for households to earn enough um, income to meet their needs from markets. And as such, Many households are expected to be unable to compensate or just barely able to compensate for the reductions in assistance that have occurred. And overall, given highly eroded coping capacity after years of protracted conflict, millions of poor households are still expected to be facing food consumption gaps associated with crisis, IPC phase three or worse outcomes, though this number is expected to have reduced slightly in June due to the seasonal improvements discussed. So in June, we expect, um, as you can see on the map, that crisis outcomes remain prevalent across the country with humanitarian assistance, which remains large scale, even though it continues at reduced levels, um, preventing emergency IPC phase four outcomes in the areas mapped with exclamation marks. I would note, though, that these are outcomes expected at the governor level, and we do expect there to be households facing um, worse outcomes um, within these governorates, particularly in Western governorates. And now turning to, oh, excuse me, turning to expectations for the projection period. Um, first, we'll look back at the seasonal calendar. And these two boxes outline our two mapped projection periods. The first projection period being June to September. Um, and the June to September period is the time of Yemen's second rainy season from approximately July to September. And this is also uh, a period that is considered a lean season in lowland areas and a semi-lean season in highland areas alongside um, relatively low levels of agricultural activities and associated access to food and income from those sources. Now, in the second map mapping period, October 2023 to January 2024, Yemen's main cereal harvest season nationwide will provide households with a slight seasonal increase in access to food from own crop production. And in highland areas, the period of peak labor demand will occur alongside the main fruit production season, which will boost access to income from agricultural labor opportunities, as well as from labor opportunities along the marketing chains in both rural and urban areas. So with that, these are our key assumptions for the projection period. First, um, levels of active conflict are expected to remain near the comparatively low levels observed in recent months alongside the continuation of peace talks, though progress continues to be slow to stalled. At the same time, economic warfare tactics are expected to continue as well, with the SBA continuing to block oil exports from IRG-controlled seaports, denying the IRG its key source of revenue. 
Both sides are also likely to continue to engage in competition for imports. And while importation supply chains are highly complex and changes are difficult to anticipate, we do expect that some further shifts in importation supply chains are likely to occur, characterized by a greater share of certain food and non-food commodities that are ultimately destined for SBA-controlled areas being redirected from IRG-controlled seaports to, IR to SBA-controlled seaports. And this expectation is based on the measures taken by the SBA to pressure traders alongside shifts that have already been observed for specific commodities such as cooking oil. And given these expectations, the IRG is expected to continue to face severe shortages of revenue and economic conditions and income earning opportunities are likely to deteriorate further in IRG controlled areas. Meanwhile, in SBA-controlled areas, the pattern of gradual improvement in economic conditions and income earning opportunities following the reduction in conflict is expected to continue. Food prices are expected to increase further in IRG-controlled areas, driven by further depreciation of the local currency. But in SBA-controlled areas, food prices are likely to remain generally stable. And in Rainfall during Yemen's July to September second rainy season is forecast to be average, and this will likely generally support crop and livestock production. And finally, the provision of humanitarian assistance is expected to continue near current levels with distributions to around 13 million beneficiaries occurring approximately once every eight weeks and with rations per distribution expected to continue to be equivalent to around 65% of households total energy needs for a one month period. Again, that will be um, spread more thin when averaged over time. And so with those assumptions underlying the most likely scenario, these are FuseNet's projected area level food security outcomes. Now, throughout the course of the entire projection period through January 2024, one um, general trend we anticipate is a general trend of declining needs in SBA controlled areas alongside slight improvement in economic conditions and income earning opportunities, as well as stable prices. On the other hand, we have the opposite expectation for IRG controlled areas where we anticipate broadly increasing needs throughout the entire projection period alongside the deterioration in economic conditions, declining income earning opportunities and rising prices. Now, across the country, we expect needs to be overall highest in the June to September period when rural households will experience seasonally low availability of food and income during their local lean seasons. Following this, in the October to January period, the main harvest season will improve availability of seasonal food and income, driving an overall slight decline in needs. However, these shifts will be relatively slight compared to the total size of the population facing food consumption gaps and crisis, IPC phase three or worse outcomes. And overall crisis and crisis exclamation mark outcomes are expected to remain widespread at the governorate level, as most Yemenis will continue facing below average income earning opportunities, above average prices, and reduce humanitarian assistance rations amid already limited coping capacity, further straining worst affected households available limited available um, resources. I would note though that in light of reductions in levels of conflict and the impacts of the favorable first rainy season, we have revised earlier projections for the June to September period for two governorates. First in Marib governorate, which was one of the con governorates most affected by active conflict, um, we now anticipate crisis exclamation mark outcomes in the June to September period rather than emergency outcomes. And in Damar governorate, an area highly dependent on agriculture, especially potatoes, we now expect crisis outcomes rather than crisis exclamation mark outcomes in the June to September period. So with that, um, thank you everyone once again, and I would be happy to answer any questions that you might have.